OK, now we've looked at part A of the question, let's take a quick look at part B and maybe the rather more important part C of Harrier Motors as well. Part B of the question asked about stock take instructions. It's worth six marks, so probably we're looking to say six things. Let's just remind ourselves of what the actual inventory or stock that Harrier Motors have got is and then think about the issues that might relate to that. So, Harrier buy and sell cars, and they've also got an extensive range of spare parts. Let's think about the cars first of all. Well, the cars will probably be individually material. Clearly, cars are quite valuable items, especially the new ones. And we also ought to bear in mind that they've got quite a few different types of car on site at any point in time. They've got the new cars. And don't forget those new cars could be from the latest imported batch or they could be from three months earlier or three months before that. And then on top of the new cars, they've got second-hand cars, part exchange cars and also, of course, on site, there could be some cars that are in for servicing which don't belong to Harrier Motors at all. Now that's going to cause a few issues. The cars are important individually and so whoever is counting them needs to make sure we have a very accurate representation of which cars we have. And there's another issue with cars as well. They have these rather annoying things on the bottom called wheels. Which means cars, of course, can be moved around fairly easily. And there is a big danger that with eight different locations, we might count cars at one place and then find they've been moved over to one of the other locations and they could be counted twice. There's also the issue that potentially Harrier might be buying and selling cars on the day of the stock take. So we need to take that into account as well. OK, so let's think about their cars. Things that the instructions would need to cover would include... Someone needs to think about how we're going to handle any sales or purchases on the day of the actual count itself. Some companies like to actually close down while they do their stock taking to make sure that they keep life simple. But on the other hand, other companies don't really want to miss out on what could be a lucrative day's business. It's no great problem as long as we think about it in advance and have a plan. One way to try to make sure that we have an accurate count of the cars is to be very detailed in what we record. Make sure that whoever's counting them notes down the age, the colour, the mileage, if there is any, because that will affect value, uh, any potential damage to some of the cars, and the vehicle registration plate, or maybe even the engine number, would help to make sure we don't count the same car twice. And if there are cars on site that don't belong to Harrier, maybe someone could pin a note inside the car 
just to make it clear to those counting that they should ignore those cars. So there are a few thoughts about the cars. Then we have the spare parts. Well, the spare parts, it says there's an extensive range, and I'm assuming that spare parts for cars will vary in their value. Some could be quite valuable, others are likely to be fairly cheap. And there could, of course, for some spare parts, be hundreds or thousands of them. And we have perpetual stock records already. So it would probably make sense for the spare parts not to be counted in full, but for someone to pick samples from the inventory records and then just check the higher value items, the items where we've got lots of them, and things like that. Also, some spare part items may be so numerous and of potentially not that much individual value that instead of counting them individually, it might make sense maybe to weigh them. If you're counting things like nuts and bolts, there's no great need to know exactly how many there are as long as we're materially close enough. A couple of other thoughts. Who do we want doing the stock take at Harrier Motors? Well, when it comes to spare parts, one issue we had in the audit risk bit of the answer was that the storekeepers are doing regular checks. We like the regular checks. We're not so keen on the fact the storekeepers are doing it. So when it comes to spare parts, I suspect we should make a note that the storekeepers should not be involved in the count unless there's others there with them. It might be handy to have them around as they'll know what each of the parts are, but somebody else should do the actual count. And there's somebody else we saw in this question who could be helpful at this point. The internal auditor only arrived towards the end of the year, but when it comes to stock takes, they are at the end of the year. So maybe the internal auditor could attend a sample of some of the locations just to make sure that the stock taking is being done properly. In fact, as an external auditor, given there are eight locations, maybe we could divide them up, share them out with the internal auditor, so that at least there is an auditor at every location. And then we could compare notes afterwards and share our results. So there are a few thoughts about part B of the question. There are, of course, a lot of issues when you're doing stock takes, but we try to make it as specific as we can to the question. Comments such as tick off particular areas once they've been counted to stop them being counted twice, having pre-numbered sequence stock sheets so that you hand them out and you know you've got them all back afterwards. Well, that's all fine, and potentially you could add it in at the end of your answer, but it's not likely to score too much because it's not specific to the company. You'd do that on any stock take, whereas the points that we've considered here have taken into account the nature of Harrier's stock. Now that's part B, which doesn't get examined that often, but part C is a very typical question on the exam. It's an audit work question. The difficulty is it's seven marks suggesting seven pieces of work for something very specific. 
the useful economic life of Harry's brand name. So just a reminder, they bought this brand name just over a year ago. It's attached to their spare parts, and they don't amortise it. The management have decided that it has an indefinite life. In other words, they can't really foresee at what point it would stop having a value. Therefore, they can't decide how many years to amortise it over. As far as they're concerned, it will go into the future. So all they therefore need to do is an annual impairment review. And since they've owned the brand for just over a year, I'm rather hoping they're going to do one at this year end. So, audit work on the useful economic life of a brand. Let's use good exam technique. When I think of audit work, there are two lists that immediately jump into my mind that should help. The first one, A-E-I-O-U, the five vowels, gives me the five basic types of audit testing procedure. Analytical involves comparing things. Inquiry and confirmation involves asking somebody a question and getting a response in writing. And then the other three speak for themselves. Inspecting things, observing or watching things and recalc you lating things. So, five types of audit work. Make sure you know that list for the exam. It can be very helpful for coming up with ideas. The other list that often is helpful when thinking of audit work is not the audit tests, but the actual evidence that you're testing. For example, I can inspect documents and get information from those. I can inspect assets to prove they exist, assess their value and stuff like that. I can ask the directors to confirm things. It's called management representations. But equally, I often will want to ask somebody else something, a third party. That could be customers, suppliers, some sort of expert like a lawyer, an actuary, a surveyor. Could be virtually anybody. And of course, third parties have a big advantage over directors, which is presumably they are independent and far less likely to want to lie to us. And finally, there is the accounting system, because often all I need to check is that something is in the correct T account, it's recorded in the appropriate asset register, and things like that. So, armed with those two lists, can we think, how would we test the useful economic life of that brand? Well, the first thing I'm thinking from AEIOU is some analytical we could compare their policy with other things. For example,
How about comparing their policy with what other car companies with branded spare parts do? There must be other such companies around. And if they also do what Harrier do, if they are not amortising their brand names, that would tend to suggest that maybe it's typical in the industry. It doesn't necessarily mean Harrier are doing the right thing, but it does give us some assurance that it's a sensible policy. In fact, there's one company in particular that I'd be keen to look at. Don't forget, Harrier only bought that brand name just over a year ago. It would be very interesting to go back, look at the company that sold that brand name to Harrier, and take a look at their financial statements. Of course, it's no guarantee that it would work, because you usually only capitalise a brand if you yourself purchased it. If the previous owner had developed that brand internally, it probably wouldn't be on their balance sheet. So, of course, it wouldn't need amortising because it's not there. But it would be worth having a look at what the previous owner was doing with that brand. So, a couple of pieces of analytical that I can think of. Now, maybe there's some more on that, but I'm going to try to use these two lists to generate a few more ideas. Um, how about enquiry? Who could we ask? Well, normally the starting point is to get the directors to tell you things, and since this is a relatively rare thing to do with a brand, not to amortise it at all, I think it would be wise to get a management representation just confirming that it is the director's view that there is a, an indefinite useful life and maybe explaining why they believe that to be so. Now that I'm thinking about inquiry, I'm tempted to think about asking a third party. Brand valuation is not the easiest thing in the world, and maybe it would be worthwhile getting an industry expert to give us their opinion as to whether this brand is likely to last a long time into the future. Now, don't forget, this was worth seven marks, so we're looking for seven tests, ideally, 
but four gets us a pass, and I think we're there. That last one, auditors don't like to use experts too often. Obviously, it adds to the cost of the audit. And if they're not an industry-specific expert, there's some doubt as to exactly how much evidence you're actually getting. But there are some other things we could do here as well. If you go to the directors and say, why do you think this brand has an indefinite life? What are they likely to tell you? How is it that companies maintain the lives of brands? Well, the answer, of course, is they advertise. So if we can see some evidence that they've been advertising this brand and that they plan to keep advertising the brand into the future, that would give us some assurance that the company are maintaining the value and therefore the life expectancy of this brand name. Now, what this company are doing is not amortising the brand. So they are saying that the brand's value now, year ended 30th of June 2004, is no different to when they bought it. What is the value of a brand? Well, surely it's the fact that it gets you more sales than if you didn't have the brand. So maybe what we should now do is ask the directors to show us their impairment review, because of course they should be doing one at the end of June, and assess it for reasonableness. What exactly will that impairment review have in it? Well, if a brand's value is based on sales, presumably the impairment review will compare sales forecasts at the 30th of June 2004 with what the projected sales forecasts were when they bought it. And if the sales are holding up and there's no sign of them reducing in the future, presumably the brand's value is being maintained. Typically, an impairment review involves looking into the future at something's value and then discounting that back to today. So as well as checking the assumptions, we should also look at the discount rate they've used and make sure that's appropriate. So maybe there's a couple of marks worth of tests on the actual impairment review itself. And they should be doing one at the 30th of June because if you don't amortise, that's the rules. If they're not doing it, we'd end up qualifying their audit report. So assuming the last one's worth a couple, we have just about managed to get to seven. But that is difficult. It is a very specific question about one particular assertion, valuation, but it's not even just about the assertion, because the value of a brand is what you paid for it minus any impairments. All we're doing here 
is looking at one part of valuation, the useful economic life. So a very specific question, which is what she tends to do on this exam, so you must make sure you understand what the question is asking so your answer is specific to it and then you need techniques to try to get some answers out. In this one we've had a bit of A, we've had a bit of E, in fact quite a lot of A because the impairment review work we're doing is basically analysis. We've inspected the impairment review, the advertising and marketing plans. There's nothing really to recalculate here. If you think through the other list, we've asked the directors. There's no asset as such, it's intangible, so you can't look at that. We've looked at documents such as forecasts, and we've thought about asking a third party. So thinking through those two lists, I think we've probably exhausted most of the things we want to do at this point. So we can just about squeeze seven marks out of it. But that is a very difficult question. So there we go, an audit risk question. It's got some audit work in it, which is fairly typical. Don't forget that anything you're asked about audit work would suggest that that area is an audit risk. So take it back into part A and get some nice easy marks there. And very importantly in part C, when doing audit work, use those two lists to help generate a few ideas. Now that we've done an audit risk question, Let's just think about financial statement risk for a minute. We don't need to get too excited by this because financial statement risk, as we saw, is simply audit risk, but with the detection risk taken out. So the technique for a financial statement risk question is pretty much the same as audit risk. But potentially we might get an audit risk or financial statement risk question that doesn't just give us words like the Harrier Motors question did, it might actually present us with some draft financial statements, presumably this year's figures and last year's. If that happens, look at the numbers that you're given in the question, and if any of those numbers have changed, and there is no explanation in the question as to why they've gone up or gone down by a fairly large percentage, then you should put that in your answer as a risk. Numbers changing from last year in quite a large way without any obvious explanation suggests it might be a mistake. It might not, of course, but at the planning stage of an audit, you're trying to identify things that might be wrong. Now, when we considered strategy, one of the things we looked at was the business risk or top-down approach to an audit. And that could lead to an exam question. The logic of this would be, stage one, you identify business risks. What could go wrong for the company? Once you've done that, the second stage would be to look at the business risks and try to identify how those could have an impact on the financial statements. In other words, financial statement risk. So let's just have a think about some risks to a company and how those might then translate into financial statement risk. So here are some potential risks to a company's operations. Let's have a think about their financial statement risk corresponding points.
So, there are a few business risks, and hopefully all of those are pretty clear risks to a business. Clearly, if your customers are being injured using your products, that can't be good for your reputation and also your cash flow, because surely they're going to sue. If you're getting a high level of returns of faulty products, again, that is bad for reputation, and your costs are going to go up, because presumably you'll have to repair and replace these things. Poor customer service is also bad for reputation, and if people are paying for, let's say, a one-year subscription to a magazine or a six-month membership of a health club, and they're not getting what they paid for, the chances are they'll want their money back. And if a company does not renew its assets in the way that it always has done in the past, over time assets will get older, they'll be less efficient, maintenance costs will go up, and potentially they're going to produce less good quality products. So all of those are clearly business risks, but can we see how they are financial statement risks? Well, the first thing to appreciate is virtually any business risk taken to its extreme could lead to the company's going concern position being called into doubt. In other words, the company could go bust. As such, any of these risks could be going concern threats. The financial statements are presented under the going concern basis and any going concern threat should be disclosed. So with all four of them, there is the potential for under-disclosure of going concern threats in the financial statements, and that is a risk to the accuracy of those financial statements. Now, I've put that one at the bottom because it affects all business risks, to be honest. Uh, but what we'd like to do is get a bit more specific. If a customer is injured using the company's products, the first thing I'm thinking about the financial statements is that surely this customer is going to sue or expect some sort of compensation. So the risk to the accounts being accurate is that the company has not adequately provided, or maybe it's a contingent liability that should be disclosed, for that situation. But it goes further than that. If a customer has been injured using the company's products, does that not suggest that there is a problem with the company's products? And if one person's been injured, maybe that means that other company products are also dangerous and it may now prove very difficult to sell certain products. So inventory valuation must also be called into question. What if there's a high level of returns of faulty products? Well, as with the first point, that would suggest that there's a problem with inventory and therefore any returned items, plus potentially items which we've not even sold yet, may be faulty and therefore the value is at issue. However, if customers are returning products, it might also suggest that receivables, debtors, could be overstated, as there might be figures waiting to be collected that will never be paid because the products were faulty. Poor customer service. 
Well, if you've bought something in advance and you're not getting what you think you paid for, the chances are you're going to demand refunds. So potentially, the financial statements of this company could be wrong because they have not adequately provided for those refunds. And finally, the last one. A company failing to renew older assets due to cash flow problems. Well, obviously, if they have cash flow problems, that might suggest going concern issues, but we've already dealt with that. Why might a company's accounts be wrong if they're not investing in new assets, replacing old ones? Well, if they're keeping hold of assets longer than they originally planned, Surely the risk is that the depreciation policy is now wrong. They might be depreciating over five years, assuming they'll replace the assets, when in fact they're keeping them for seven or eight. It's worth practicing that as much as you can. For anything that could go wrong for a business, ask yourself, how would that impact on the accuracy of their financial statements? It's a very useful skill to have to see the entire world from the point of view of accounts. So there we go. Business risk can be linked into financial statement risk. And notice that a lot of the financial statement risks we've mentioned there are issues about assets being overvalued, and about provisions being understated. And I'd make a note of that if I were you, because often with financial statement risk questions and audit risk questions, those tend to be the main risks.